So finally I got the opportunity to head out and shoot a bit. Uh, what a pleasure. Yesterday was a beautiful day in Cape Town. It was one of those clear, beautiful, crisp winter's days. I mean, it's stormy at the moment. It's raining outside now, but yo, I really took the opportunity yesterday to get out. It's about two and a half hours. I just drove to a couple of spots and I didn't actually care what I photographed. I just photographed whatever was in front of me. But what a pleasure to be out again. Really enjoy the fresh air and just a bit of freedom. Today I'm going to be talking about RAW, JPEG, as well as profiles. I'm not really going to get into your color space, your, your, your color gamut. You know, this, this topic can actually go quite wide. You know, there's a lot of information around sort of RAW and JPEG that you could delve into. I'm trying to keep this as short as possible. I'm sure you've all heard people say, well, I shoot RAW, I shoot JPEG. These are the reasons why you should. You should be shooting RAW. That's all fine, but I think it's very important that you understand what exactly is happening in your camera. And for me, it's really simple without getting too technical. You're either wanting to process and develop the image yourself in software, or you're asking the camera to do that for you. Now, by asking the camera to do that for you, you are restricting any further processing and developing that could be done on that image to some degree. I'm sure when you're going through your menu, you've seen the output options that you have when you're copying images to your memory card. You have the option of either shooting RAW or JPEG. Now, JPEG might not be written in the menu as JPEG. It might be written as large, medium, or small. It might be written as fine or whatever it might be. Those are all referencing JPEGs and different compression levels and different downsamplings and things like that. But effectively, you have the two options between RAW and JPEG uh, or shooting both together. All right, so understanding RAW, you've really got to understand compression. Now, RAW itself is not a name for a particular file. We're talking like a generic name for all type of files that fit into this category. So you'll find that Canon has a different file. It's called CR2. You'll have Nikon, I think, is NEF. Leica is DNG. Fujifilm, RAF. Those are all RAW files. They don't have the same file name and the, and the cameras can't read each other's files. They are, um, you know, they are particular files for that particular brand, but they're all considered RAW files. All right, now within RAW files, you get different types of compression. On the newer Fujifilm X-Series cameras, they've now got RAW recording in uncompressed, lost as compressed, and compressed. Uncompressed, the information comes off that sensor, including camera information, lens information, all the information that's going to be required to build up that image in the processing or demosaic the image in processing software is all found in that RAW file. It's a lot of information, it's a large file. What lossless compression does for you is it actually is able to almost like zip it, zips the file down without losing any information, without extracting any information, and is able to give you a smaller size file, which obviously allows you to get more images on the memory card and more images in your hard drive and so on and so forth. Now, from my experience, there is no difference that I've seen between a uncompressed file and a lossless compressed file when it comes to RAW. They're the same and I'm happily just shooting lossless all the time. So I'd recommend if you're shooting raw to shoot lossless compression, you're not losing anything. Maybe someone out there has worked out there's a slight difference, but the name itself lossless should imply that it, it's, it's, it doesn't have any loss of information. Now I don't know exactly what's going on with the compressed option. It's pretty new. It's not found in the old X-Series bo series bodies. But very strange is that when I look at the file size, um, it's almost the same as lossless compressed. I think lossless in some of the situations, depending on what image and what it was captured, the lossless might have been slightly bigger by a megabyte or two. So I'm not quite sure why you would choose compressed over lossless. Doesn't make sense to me, but I'll obviously have to do a little bit more research into that. Uh, but on the older X-Series bodies, you would have just had uncompressed and lossless compressed. Then it comes to JPEG. Uh, JPEG is a compressed file and it's compressed, uh, what we call lossy compression, all right? Here we actually have information being extracted out of the file, the original uh, raw information, and then it's compressed down into a smaller file, all right, known as a JPEG in a camera. So you're able to get way more images on your memory card. You're able to get way more images on each hard drive when you're storing the, all the files, when you're storing it on your hard drive. But you've got to understand that that information that was extracted, you can never get back again. So it's not a zip file. You can't just put it into software and sort of uncompress it and get back all that information that was lost. Once it's baked in, once it's compressed, that is it. That is the file. In image quality, you'll find fine, normal, fine and raw, normal and raw, and raw. Obviously, normal and raw and fine and raw, those are both JPEG and raw combined. Raw is by itself. And when you shoot fine and normal by themselves, you're just shooting JPEG out of camera, no, no raw images recorded to card. Now, unlike some other cameras that have sort of la large, medium, and small, and different variations of JPEG, Fujifilm has just chosen to have these two, and they're not actually different sizes. It's not a down-sampled image, whether you go for normal or 
um, over fine. It's just a, a far more aggressively compressed image. So the actual pixel count is exactly the same on both. It's just a, a far smaller image. So in fine, you can get up to sort of 20 megabytes at maximum per image. In normal, you're looking maybe about six megabytes per image. Um, and in raw, depending on whether you go for uh, compressed, which is kind of around the 60 megabyte image, lossless is around the 30, and compressed is anywhere from 25 to 30. So that kind of gives you an idea of the file size. A very important part of this conversation is bit depth. A raw image, if your camera's been made in the last sort of four to five years, is anywhere from 10 bits to 14 bits. A JPEG image, when compressed down, is an 8-bit image. Now that's a, that may not sound a lot to you between 14 and 8, but when you actually understand bit depth, that is quite a big difference between 14 and 8 when it comes to the information that you have in that file. Let's take a digital image. When we zoom in on the image, what it's made up of is pixels. Now, each one of those pixels on that image is a color. All right, and that color is made up of different values found in RGB, red, green, and blue. So depending on what value and where it is, those three colors make up that color of that pixel. When we talk about RGB, red, green, and blue, we're talking about three channels. And when we talk about eight bit image, we're talking about eight bits per channel. So effectively, it's 24 bits per pixel, but we call it an eight bit image because we're referring to each channel. Eight bits red, eight bits green, if it's blue. So although a lot of the software we deal with uh, is dealing in decimals, so if you go into the color pick on Photoshop for example and you pick a particular color, it represents it as a decimal number. What's really happening and what's going on in the camera and also in the software is binary value, or binary communication in zeros and ones. In these three channels, red, green and blue, you have tone or tonal values and your bit depth determines how many values there are. The transition through from white all the way to black. So if you take a one bit image, for example, a bitmap image, which you've seen, I'm sure you've all seen before, it effectively has in binary terms only has a zero and a one. That's white or black. All right, so there is no transition between white and black. There are no mid grays or mid tones in between. It's either one or the other. That's why bitmap image looks the way it does because effectively all it is is white and black. Now, the more tonal value you have, the greater the bit depth, uh, the more grays and midtones that you have, the better the transition. So you'll see as the bit depth increases, you'll see that the transition across the midtones from black to white smoothens out and gradiates far better. You don't have that sort of line in between bigger steps jumping between each of those tones. So how many tonal values does an 8-bit image have? These transitions I'm talking about. Well, it's 2 to the power of how many b uh, bits you have. So it's 2 to the power of 8. gives you 256 tonal values. Now actually it's 255 but if you include zero which is black it gives you a total of 256. Now if you're looking at a 14-bit image for example you have 16,384 so the difference between 256 tonal values a 14-bit image has 16,384 that's the difference between the JPEG in your camera and the RAW in your camera okay now, if we had to work out color, which is RGB because there's three channels, what you need to do is you need to times 256 by 256 by 256, and that gives you how many colors, variations in colors that you have within the tonal value. And that gives you just short of 16.8 million. That's something like 16.7 something million colors. Whereas um, with the 14-bit image out of your camera, you're getting 4.4 trillion variations to colors. Now what does this actually mean? How practical is this? Well, uh, the reality is your human eye can only see roughly about 10 million variations at the most, at the top end, that's what they uh, sort of estimate. So you're getting way more color than what your actual human eye can even see. That's why when you produce a beautiful JPEG out of camera, you're not going to notice the banding, you're not going to notice these transitions in the tonal values, the image looks great. So why not we all shoot JPEG? Well, it's not so much about whether you can perceive it or not, it's what you plan to do with that image. Well, you've got to ask yourself, are you interested in post-production at all? Are you going to be working on images? Now, I haven't done this as a scientific test. I'm just going on what I know from experience. The difference when it comes to um, pushing and pulling a file in post-production, as in correcting exposure or adjusting exposure in post-production, and the difference between 8 bits and 14 bits is dramatic. From, from my experiments, I wouldn't push a JPEG in post-production if I have to work on it more than a stop or so, maybe 
you know, pulling back a stop, pushing a stop in the same image as in the highlights and the shadows. So maybe maximum of two stops in its entirety uh, be before issues start sort of appearing in the image. And the reason why the issues start is because you've only got that limited tonal value at 8 bits at 256 and even though you've got more colors than possibly could be perceived by the human eye once you start editing and manipulating that file uh, adjusting color uh, adjusting exposure pushing and stretching those tonal values then the gaps start to appear and the banding starts to appear you start to see those transitions from the different tonal values within the colors and this is where the difference is so you'll see like a smooth gradient area like a blue sky once you start pushing a jpeg too far in that blue area the sky starts to band you've seen it i'm sure before that banding that occurs in the sky you've gone way beyond what the eight bits can give you you now stretch it out too far and you're getting gaps and you're getting these hard transitions in the, in the sort of gradients the tonal values so the 14 uh, bit is going to give you exponentially more uh, expansion here way way more way more like for example as i said with the jpeg image you've got like two stops leeway to sort of correct it well if you were say for example if you have a 12-bit camera you could probably push that out to about three three and a half stops i'm talking about shooting at the base iso your your minimum base uh, raw iso um iso um if you've got a 14-bit camera like i do i can push five six stops uh, quite easily so that's a huge difference. And to add to this, this is a comment I hear a lot. And it frustrates me a little bit, to be perfectly honest. Why do you need to shoot raw if you should be getting exposure right in camera? Like, you're wasting your time. If you're a good photographer, you should be able to expose correctly in camera. Like, I don't have a problem with the idea of exposing correctly in camera. I think what I have a problem with is the understanding of what exactly it means to expose correctly in camera. What are you exposing for? You Like... When you hear that, it, like it's, 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 it's as if every scene you are capable of exposing it correctly. There's so many times where you just physically cannot expose correctly because there is no correctly. Because your highlights in the scene are so bright and your shadows are so dark in one scene, you cannot cover, you can't choose, you can't cover all across the scene. You don't have enough dynamic range with an 8-bit image to cover that whole scene. You're forced to have to either expose for the shadows or expose for the highlights. And you lose a lot of information so when you're standing there and you're looking at a scene with the human eye and your human eye has incredible dynamic range you're able to balance the whole scene out and you're able to get detail in the sky and you're able to get detail in in the area that you're looking at the landscape but you know there's a five stop swing here and that falls with outside of the realms of eight bits a compressed jpeg cannot do that and this is where a 14 bit image comes in you can push and push process that thing you can bring down the sky by two three stops you can raise the shadows in the landscape by two three stops you've got a six stop swing there and you've got a workable image you've got an image that's actually closer to what your eyes saw than what you were getting with an 8-bit J 8 jpeg image so i don't buy that argument i really don't like it, oh, why aren't you exposing right in camera you know like if you had to see how i expose off the back of my screen for the most of the work i do you'd be shocked because i don't expose I don't expose for someone to be impressed with the image on the back of my LCD. I expose for what I'm going to be doing in post. I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily use the histogram all the time. I don't have time in the type of shooting that I do. But I know where to expose left or expose right. I know where to expose for the shadows and the highlights. I know what I'm going to be doing in post to be able to correct some of these issues. And I don't buy the argument that you should only shoot raw because you may be a person who has no interest at all in post-production work and you couldn't care about even wanting to edit these images later in life, like down the road. You, you just want to enjoy yourself. You just want to use the simulations that are in the camera, the profiles, make a couple of adjustments, and you're happy with what the camera produces for you. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, and I know some professional photographers who pride themselves in, in, sh in shooting straight out of camera. Then they actually even do tutorials and courses on how to get it right in camera. But the reality is, because the camera has processed the image for you, it's taken all these settings, including sharpness, including white balance, including all these important aspects, it's baked it into the image, it's compressed it, um, whereas a RAW has done none of, none of that. You know, there's no white balance that's been... It, it, it's in the information what the white balance was when you shot, shot the, you know, the, the image on your camera, but it's not part of the image. It's a non-destructive form of, of file. So when you take it into post-production, you're not actually working on the raw image. You are working on the information around that raw image, like a recipe in your catalogs. 
and you can edit that image as many times as you want. You're not touching the original at all. Uh, very, very powerful. You can change your color space. If you want to go print at a printer that only does C C Y M K or C M K Y or whatever it is, S A S R G B, whatever it is, those things on set in the raw image. Your sharpening you can adjust. So if you've sh over sharpened in camera when you made a JPEG, well you can't unsharpen that image. You can try, but it's going to be terrible. If you want to change the color space around that image, it's going to give you bad results. If you want to push beyond two stops, it's going to give you bad results. So. And, and that's not because you didn't get it right in camera, it's because the scene requires that you have to push and pull it a bit to get the image to what it should look like, a better image. This brings on the topic of profiles. And I think this is where Fujifilm has really made a strong statement. There are people who uh, get into the Fujifilm system just for the profiles. And what they're doing is that they're shooting JPEG because they want the images to look um, a certain way out of camera using these uh, simulations. and they've created multiple custom settings where they can skip between the different simulations pretty quickly, different, uh, different sort of highlight and shadow levels, different sharpening, and they can read a scene and they can flip between these things pretty quickly. And they're very happy with what they get out of camera and they can sort of share with their cell phone pretty quickly and they can send it off onto Instagram and all these different things. Like that, Fujifilm has a massive market for this. Some of them go shoot RAW and JPEG, which I think is a very sensible option. So they get the benefit of these beautifully processed, in-camera processed images, but they've got that RAW they can store away, they can work on it at another stage and they can share the JPEGs immediately to Instagram or whatever it might be. When you decide to output to RAW, irrespective of whether you're doing RAW and JPEG, the camera produces a small preview image. It's a JPEG image, a compressed image. And that image contains all the settings that have been made in the camera. Uh, you know, the tone curve adjustments, the color, the sharpness, the white balance, all these different things that uh, you would have set if you were shooting a JPEG get created anyway. They actually get added into the information of the raw image. And the reason why they do that is that when you hit the playback button on the camera, the image that gets presented on the LCD is actually a JPEG. And that's why sometimes you'll see an image on the back of your LCD, it looks great, you know, has vibrant and so on and so forth. And then when you get it into production, it sort of looks a lot flatter. And that's because you're looking at the raw image in post-production, but you're looking at a preview JPEG, which had all the settings attached to it. In the, on the JPEG that's presented on the LCD. So outside of the obvious, bitrate, dynamic range, color, what are the benefits of shooting JPEG? Well, there are lots of jobs out there that uh, professional photographers or photographers only require a JPEG. Now, the type of imagery that you're never gonna go further and edit them later, you have no need to. It might be sporting event, might be events in general, people. You know, the client needs the image straight away. Sometimes in the sporting events, they need the image while the sporting event is still happening. Well. You know, with these great simulations that Fujifilm offers and also the ability to, to do a lot of adjustment in camera, you can really get the image looking amazing out of camera and send it off very quickly in a relatively small file and it's in the client's hands very quickly and the job is done. So it's really a horses for courses sort of situation. You've got to decide what you need. Now in my line of work, I always shoot raw. I'm always going to need the raw because I never know what I'm going to capture. I don't want to be capturing something really incredible that I know I'd be using in my portfolio or something that's very important and I didn't have the raw image. It just doesn't make sense. And also I don't really expose, the way I expose for my images, I expose, I've, I've just taught myself to expose for edit. I don't expose for looking good in camera. I expose for the way I'm going to edit the image afterwards. So it's a hard habit to break. So I tend to shoot in that particular way. Um, but certainly I have no issue with uh, shooting JPEG if I have to, if, if my client required that. There are massive advantages to RAW. The obvious, I think the most obvious is that it's non, it's a non-destructive form of editing. So even though you can take your JPEGs into Lightroom and you can import them into a catalog and you can work on them and then effectively, because it's working on the recipe in the, in the catalog, you're not actually touching the original JPEGs. But the question is, are you going to keep duplicates of JPEGs? Because if you finish it, finishing, finished the edit on the JPEGs, those minor adjustments that you do, and then you save it, are you going to keep the original JPEGs and then keep the second JPEGs? And then is there a point of doing that? Should have you not just taken RAW and then created a JPEG? So I'd imagine a lot of people would do those adjustments, save to JPEG and then get rid of the originals and those are the JPEGs. Now you've got to understand if you go work on a JPEG image twice or three times, it's a destructive form of editing. The image degrades every single time you touch it. If you can afford uh, you know, decent sized memory cards and hard drives, which I think they're reasonably priced now, although I can't presume everyone can afford them. If you can, then I would recommend 
to shoot raw and JPEG and then just share your JPEGs if you're happy with them, if you want to get them out on social media and stuff like that. That's probably the most sensible route. In my case, I don't do a lot of that, so it's just raw. All right, so what I have here is uh, three images that I'm going to go through. Uh, the first one is of um, one of the guys surfing. Now, I've chosen this image not because I like it necessarily. Uh, there's a lot wrong with this image, but I'm really just showing you from a dynamic range point of view, and I want to show you the difference between this and a JPEG out of camera. Now, as I said earlier, you know, some, some people say, you know, you really got to get exposure right in camera and you shouldn't really be relying on RAW. Well, this is a situation where the, the, the surf is riding down the wave, the whole wave is in shadow in the front, the sun shining on the back of the wave. You don't know when um, that light's going to affect the surface. So he kicks out his board, does a turn, and the spray goes up into the sun, and that goes beyond um, your exposure that you've set in camera. Um, so... He has a situation where you don't have control and being able to shoot with a 14-bit RAW, you have a lot of control. It means that you can bring back that detail. So let me just show you. This is a RAW image that I'm showing you. Uh, let me go to the um, JPEG image. Now, they have the exact same color profile. Because I shot RAW and JPEG, you can see on the right here, Lightroom automatically adds that profile in. Uh, if you look at the JPEG here, all that information there looks like one white blob. Um, I'm going to see if I can sort of retain it, bring it back in. Let's start with that JPEG. Let me see if I can bring it down with the highlights. It's full highlight pull down. Um, you can see here these sections here are all gone. All gone. There's no detail. That there's all one solid mass of color. Uh, and there's banding in between. You can actually see the banding in the highlights. You might not be able to pick it up on this recording uh, on my screen, but there's banding inside the highlights on that wave. I could even go to tone curve and try bring it back even further, but you can just see it becomes like a mush. Uh, not great at all. So um, there's not really much I can do about that. I would probably just have to live with it if I was uh, shooting JPEG. Um, I probably wouldn't have to, wouldn't pull it back that far. I'd probably take it to about there so that it doesn't affect other parts of the image, bring in a little bit of shadow, maybe about a stop. So maybe about two stops in total, stop, shadow um, pushed and a highlight pulled. Uh, and then make some sort of small tweaks as well, um, maybe even color tweaks. You can see there, but just want to show you as well. That's that's the that's adjusting luminance of blue to make the sea behind darker. You see, how it kind of starts to make it darker, but then it starts going like this gray thing. You've also only got about a sort of I don't know what what you'd call it a stop, but you've only got around about a stop of pull as well, and pushing with each individual channel of color. Um, yeah, so. Uh, sort of very interesting to see sort of the limitations of the JPEG image. Let me go back to the RAW. Let me show you how I would edit it. I'd probably drop my whole exposure just a little bit, just about there. All right. And then start bringing back the water. You can see a couple of little points here where it might be lost, but there's a lot more detail there. And then I'd bring up my shadows uh, like that. I might even, I could probably bring up my exposure a bit more, but then my water gets lost. So I don't want to push the highlights too much. I'd rather do that. And where I've got a lot of information, a lot of detail, I'll probably bring up a graduated filter or I'll paint it back in or something like that just to be able to get more light on the surfer. Um, yeah, so that's probably the kind of direction I would take. I'm, I would probably do a lot more. But just to show you an example of obviously the luminance, you see how, see how the blue just goes, you know, darkens up beautifully. It doesn't go that sort of mushy. So I'd probably do that, that. Um, yeah, something like that on the water. And I'd probably bring out a bit of, see if I can kind of pick it, sort of brighten it up a bit on the water as well, which is the green and the yellow. So yeah, that's kind of how the image would look um, if I was going to do a quick edit on it. And you want to, I'm actually just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to copy all those settings across onto the JPEG, except for sharpening. So check all sharpening, because they've got different sharpening because it's a JPEG. And let's go have a look and see what's happened. Okay, so you can see the images there, the same adjustments made to the, not that you would do them the same because they're not the same type of file, but you can just see that highlight is totally gone. Okay, now this is a mild example of the difference between 14 bits and 8 bits and compression and uncompressed. All right, the second image I'm moving on to is a landscape from the end of the evening. Um, the sun has gone down on the left hand side. There's actually a bank of clouds here where my cursor is. So the sun has actually disappeared before it's hit the horizon and it's really sort of brightly lit up the sky, but yet this whole mountainside has fallen into shadow. Um, 
sort of before the actual sunset happened. This is the JPEG image. You see how there's a bit of a jump in the image. Um, there was the raw, there's the JPEG, and you see how the middle of the image changed. It actually bent in. That's because uh, that information that gets included into the JPEG compression uh, is lens adjustments, lens corrections for distortion. So Fujifilm has certain um, bits of information depending on what lens is attached and it makes uh, in-camera corrections as well. So you can see the difference, there's the RAW, uh, there's the JPEG and note, most notably, look how much, if you're looking from a color perspective, even though I was talking about how much we can perceive, because of the tonal values, because of the greater tonal values and also the wider gamut, which I didn't talk about today, it's a bit more of a complex thing, but there is a relationship between the color gamut and the bit depth as well. Uh, you can see uh, because of the wider gamut, how much uh, more vivid the cover, colors are, even though I haven't done any editing to the image, how much more color was retained in this area here, uh, and they're identical images. You can see it, it's, it's quite obvious. So, um, so let's go work on the raw image first. Um, all right, so the way I would have shot this if I was shooting it raw only and not doing an experiment for JPEG for you, is I probably would have shot at a stop under, something like that, all right, just because I, this is the most important area to sort of work on. This is where I'm going to lose details. So I'd be focusing on this just to the point where I know I can ret retain the shadow detail um, in the mountainside. So this is how I would have shot it. So if you saw the back of my LCD on the day, you would have gone, oh, bad exposure. And this is the problem with this idea of a perfect exposure. It's actually not, you, you're exposed to edit, you don't look for a perfect exposure in your camera, unless you're shooting JPEG, of course, then you're going to have to do your best. So here I am, a stop under, that would have been how I would have shot it, but I'm going to bring it down anyway in post. I'm going to take my highlights down a little bit further. You can just see I'm getting the sky back. It actually has a lot of information there. If I go too far, so you can see here it starts to band around this area here. So I'm going to take that back up to where I think it's acceptable. I think that's fine. It's retaining the information. And now I think I'm going to need a full shadow pu uh, push. That's full and the whole mountainside comes back. Uh, bearing in mind this is ISO 640, so it would have even been better if I'd locked this off and I was using a tripod or I was able to shoot at a base ISO um, with a slower shutter speed. But nevertheless, uh, I'm very happy. This is retaining a lot of information in the shadows. I don't have to do a lot to this image. Obviously, I could go in and do whites. Um, I could even add clarity and more uh, vibrance and things like that into the image, which I would normally probably do. And I also shot Velvia here just to show you the dramatic sort of simulation. Might not have been my choice on the day to go with Velvia. These are all the loaded Fujifilm simulations, which are the same as the camera. That's Astia, that's Classic Chrome, that's Eterna, that's Proneg High, which is the one I use a lot of. Um, Proneg Standard, Provia, which is something I use as well, which I quite like here. I actually think Provia is a little bit more natural, uh, probably better suited. And then Velvia, which is the one. So I'll keep it on Velvia because that's how I shot it and that's what the JPEG is. So you can see already um, just by making uh, one stop under with exposure, two stops with the highlights, pushing the shadow all the way, making a couple of little adjustments. I've got the image pretty close to where I want it anyway. I'd probably do a little bit of dodge and burn just to give it a bit more drama, but you can see how powerful this tool is. Now, if I were to immediately just go copy this over uh, to the JPEG image like I did earlier, um, yeah, you're going to see how this breaks down terribly. You see how, see how sort of oversaturated the sky is? Um, that's purely because of that tonal, that limited gamut range. It's got a narrow gamut on the S sRGB. So immediately it's, the colors are going to be a bit more pronounced and sort of banding and things like that. This whole section here is banding. This is banding. You can see the transition. There's no information here at all. Even if I take that all the way back, it only gets worse on the highlight slider. You know, not great at all. I'd have to probably desaturate it quite a bit just to get it a bit more natural, something like that. Um, and to be honest, I'm so unimpressed with it. I'll probably make it a square crop and get rid of that ugly sky on the left-hand side anyway. So you can see, here again, nothing about creating correct exposure in camera on the day. You just can't. It's not possible with a JPEG image. And, you know, you could do multiple images. You could do HDR, but then you might as well just shoot a raw image if you're going to go to that extent of, of sort of getting it right in camera. If I was to edit this without comparing it to the um, original, to the raw image, I'd probably let that sky burn out a bit more. Probably bring that back in, bring in the cliff a bit more. I'd probably do something like that. Not that I would be happy with it, but that's what I'd land up doing.
This is actually an edited image. This is what was a raw image. I edited it, edited it. Now it's a JPEG image, um, but the initial image was raw. Now this is an imperfect image. I'm showing an example where exposure I didn't get quite right, and that's purely just because of the nature of the shot and sort of the way I got the shot, which I'll explain. All right, going to the JPEG image, um, you can compare it here to the raw image, that's JPEG first, that's raw. And really, without even editing the image, you can actually see the dynamic range. You can see how the blacks have been crushed in the JPEG. So that's that limited tonal value. You can see it sort of jumps immediately into a shadow. Uh, not much detail in the shadow, where if I go to the raw, without even editing, I can already see a lot more detail in his face and around the shadow areas. The rest of this, the shots in the series are actually a lot better from an exposure point of view, but this is the expression I like. So I walked up on him, he was about to push himself off that edge into the water, and I was taking a photograph of him without him noticing, I was trying to get him to on the jump into the water, but he turned and looked at me and I got the shot. So I hadn't had time yet to set up and sort of look at the sky and sort of, you know, really correctly expose it. So if I was to look at the raw image again, I probably would have been shooting, even though I've lost detail in the sky because it's so dramatic, this mistake. I probably would have been two stops under. That's how the shot would have looked on the back of my LCD because I, kn I know I would have been able to retain information and get the shot that I wanted. So again, remember to shoot for e shoot to edit if you're shooting raw. Don't shoot just to make it look great on the LCD on the back of the camera. So you can see that's about two stops. That's how I would have um, shot it. Now obviously looking at the JPEG here, sun just coming through holes in the sky, very bright, at least four stops over br brighter than what we are, sort of the foreground where he's sitting. You know, even if I was to have shot the JPEG around there, which is a stop under, and pushed the shadows, I can already see banding starting in his chest, uh, that sky and coming back. So irrespective of my mistake on the exposure, you were never going to get that sky and him in on a JPEG image compressed at 8 bits. So yeah, so let me go back to the um, raw. Let me just show you. I'm not going to edit to the ex extent that I edited the, the final one that you saw there, which was obviously quite vivid. I like vivid colors. I'm a little bit over the top sometimes, but it's just the way I love when you print those images big, how powerful they are with the colors. Uh, and that was printed very big for someone. So that's why it's, it's like, it's that vibrant. So anyway, um, digressing. Let me go and quickly edit this. So as I said, I probably would have started the exposure there. You can see the sky, even just dropping a one stop, I can see the sky coming back. And I would have taken this all the way to the point where you can see how it's starting to band just on the white to there. So that the transition from the whitest part to the colors looks more natural. Then I would have brought his shadows in like this, almost a full shadow, maybe bring it back a bit. Uh, a little bit of clarity, uh, clarity just a little bit a little bit sometimes I use the dehaze just I don't like using it too much but a vibrance and then I would have gone and used my HSL I'd have uh, brightened up the water a little bit sorry darkened the water but saturated it a little bit more there's a nice little section there of aqua color that's sort of sitting around there um, which you can also paint in if you wanted to which I did on the final image because you can see that band of color sitting there that you want to bring bring out but I'm just showing you a really basic edit so let me just Bring that out a little bit. So he has the sort of the basic edit that I've done. And I'm going to now just sort of copy it across onto that JPEG image. Just remember not to add the white balance and the treatment and the sharpening is off. Let's go have a look at that there. And you can see, you can just see where the information is lost in the file. If I go in on his chest here, you can actually have a good look. Um, sorry, go in there. Have that area there. Um, you can actually see the banding in this area here. You can actually see where the transition from the highlights across onto him, you're losing information here. And that's, that's a stop under with just around two stops of highlights. If I bring that back again, it's still not great. Yeah, you know, it's quite limited. If I go to the raw image here, you can actually see how much better it handles these highlights. How the transitions look way more smoother and the gradients are way better. The color is much more realistic. Um, yeah, you can't really compare these two. I'm just waiting for the image to clear. Yeah, there you go. You, you just can't really compare them. Um, yeah, you really got to decide what's best for you, the way you shoot. If you want to edit, you want to just enjoy the camera, get it right in camera. You don't really care if you miss the odd exposure, as long as overall you're getting what you want. And that's the level you want to sort of operate at. You might be in a business where you hand over images quickly, whatever it is. If JPEG's your thing, JPEG's your thing. That's really cool. I would say the vast majority of you though would 
should and would consider raw. That's my opinion. I think if you're getting into photography for the first time, I think you should seriously consider it. Give it a go, practice with it because it will open up photography for you in lots of different options. Um, it will also teach you how to shoot in a certain way. You'll shoot to edit as opposed to just shoot because you'll understand what you can do with the file and you'll view what you're shooting differently. Um, and then the obvious things like, you know, the non-destructive sort of editing process, um, the longevity it gives you, being able to keep a raw and being able to edit it 20 years later or 30 years later with better software than what we have now that might even render better results. There's so many possibilities with raw um, that I would seriously consider it as my number one output file. Um, but again, that's entirely up to you. Thanks so much for your time. Really, really do appreciate it. If this video was a benefit to you, please do like the video and subscribe. Go visit my channel. There's lots of reviews and tutorials there. Take care and God bless.